Welcome in everybody to Fantasy Pros. This is the Fantasy Baseball Podcast. This is Joe Pisa. Pia here with me as always is the Welsh and it's time to take a look at some draft day bargains. We've got 12 names for you that we think are just priced right for you to get the most fantasy baseball goodness out of in 2024. Before we get to those names, Welsh we did have a signing finally after oh, what seems like the most eternally long offseason ever for certain guys, including Blake Snell, who now finds himself on the San Francisco Giants. He joins Logan Webb at the top of that rotation. So before we dive into some bargain hunting, uh, this is, I think, a must sign kind of for the Giants. They desperately needed somebody else there with Webb. Hi um, Kyle Harrison, Jordan Hicks. And Keaton Wynn right now, those are the back-end starters for this rotation. But let's talk about Blake Snell. Two-year deal. There is an opt-out, but certainly a great win for the Giants, and especially because you didn't have to commit a very long-term contract to him. Yeah, and that's what they've been doing. They've been not committing these big long-term contracts to be competitive in this division where the Dodgers are powerhouses. Um, you know, the Padres have made some interesting moves, but they've been a little flatlined until the Dylan Cease trade. Diamondbacks, obviously, World Series. You want to stay competitive. This is a great way to do it. And they're setting themselves up where you've got a one-two punch of Webb and Snell for the foreseeable mm -hmm. future. If healthy on the back end and they were to make a playoff run, they got Robbie Ray. So... This is a big L for Scott Boris and the money. At least Snell did get, you know, a $30 million deal uh, per year, and it looks like he's going to be able to have his opt-outs. But what is so fascinating is we were at the precipice. We were about to explode where we were going to say, we can't draft Blake Snell. It was already getting there. We can't do it. We can't do it. But then we find well, out. Well, not at current ADP. We couldn't. I, but, well, I ADP couldn't. was high. It was in the 60s. But then uh, over the last week on NFBC, it had been moving down into the 80s. That's what I'm saying. We were four, three or four days from it moving down into like post one, you know, 50 or something mm -hmm. like that. But we got the word a couple of days ago that he did uh, pitch a full four inning simulated game, which kind of shows how he's been ramping up. I think there's a decent possibility that the ramp up is going to be minimal and maybe he misses just like a game or two or, or they just skip in the rotation. This is a great destination. And I think we can be a little bit optimistic and hopefully not sure we will, but hopefully we can take the discount on Snell if you're in the Snell market, because he's a little polarizing. He is. Boy, what a great division, too. Arizona going to the World Series last year, the juggernaut Dodgers, now the Giants kind of, you know, saying, hey, we're going to be competitive in this thing, too. And they were busy this offseason. Uh, they went out there and they signed Solaire, uh, Jung-Hoo Lee, uh, Matt Chapman. So the Giants are making moves out there, which is good. You want teams to be spending money on players, not just pocketing it. So that's a good thing. Good environment for Blake Snell and still where he's got to go out there and perform. It's not some seven year deal where he can just kind of rest on the laurels. So let's get into some of the draft day bargains. Everybody we're talking about. These are players going from somewhere between 100 to 280 P overall consensus, which you can find at fantasypros.com, Of course, on our rankings page for MLB, you can also find the draft kit on there, which is free. So you can check that out also. So Welsh, why don't you kick things off with a guy and you got to the show sheet first. This was the first guy I was going to run to. And really? You put him in the show sheet. So turnabout is fair play, my friend. Oh, I did not know that this was going to happen. That's a great thing to hear. By the way, you know, uh, differentiating a lot of the different topics we've talked about, and this is, you know, a brand new one of Draft Day Bargains. It, it lives in the same general family as, you know, the the breakouts and the sleepers and stuff like that. But the identification here clearly is like, these guys are really good deals at what they do. Upside mm -hmm. is I'm not really sure, but where they're going just doesn't quite make sense to what they produce. And that player that jumps out to me is Cattell Marte. No homerism uh, attached. Put it aside here. I know I'm a Diamondbacks fan, but Cattell Marte last season, 276 average, 25 homers, 94 runs, 82 RBI, and eight stolen bases. Projections have him in the 20 homers again, have him near the 10 stolen bases. Anywhere from the high 80s on really both the run and RBI numbers, everything is still in play. After low strikeout numbers, he had a double-digit walk rate, and his actual hitting profile, he increased his hard hit percentage this past year. He increased year-over-year year his barrel percentage. His expected batting average, his expected numbers were 
within a general space of where it needs to be. And one thing Cattell has always done, he actually did at the highest degree. He always is one of those guys that is one of the hardest hit balls in baseball. Every single season, you're going to find the leaderboard for the max EV top 10. Cattell's going to get in there. But his average EV, they can sometimes kind of float around. Like here's an example. In 2018 with the Diamondbacks, he had a 115.1 max EV but an 88 average, so the average hits. Well, last year was tied for a career high of 91.1. So he's been making better contact, finding some comfort in stealing. Maybe the Diamondbacks are going to want to steal a little bit more. But the big important thing here is the low ADP. It pushes near outside mm -hmm. the top 100. And when you look at the scope of the second basemen that are out there, I'm not saying you don't take Ozzy Albies to take Cattell Marte, but the line between Ozzy Albies and Cattell Marte, especially considering the ADP value, is something to pay attention to. And not all positions have this. I've said that, like, I don't mm -hmm. think, I personally don't think third base has that close of a line. I don't think first base necessarily has that line. Outfield, short, you know, they can all do that. Second base, there are some good depthy options and Cattell Marte I think is one of the best draft day bargains I could not agree more uh this was again the first guy that came to my mind we were talking about this topic and uh so you could take Welsh's homerism even if he had it for Marte off the table because I'm co-signing this as well uh you mentioned that pivot if you don't get Simi you don't get Albies this is the pivot. I mean, what a fantastic guy right around 100. Speaking of guys going around 100 at 103, Seiya Suzuki, who I actually just drafted in our last mock draft. And after I took him, I was like, you know, why don't I have more shares of this guy? And last year, uh, going into the season, I was a little bit skeptical. Even his rookie year, I was somebody saying, look, let's pump the brakes. Let's see what this guy is. He was pretty good in 2022. I wouldn't say he was great. 260 batting average, 14 homers. He only played 111 games. He missed some time with injury. Last year, he missed some time with injury too, but 138 games. You saw the power develop a little bit more. 20 homers for him. The batting average jumped 20 points over a longer period of time. You love to see the growth there. You see the walk rate is around 10%. That's really solid. And when you consider Welsh that outfield is so problematic and you're looking for a guy with decent value. I'm looking at the projections right now. He's going to hit in the two hole in this order in front of Cody Bellinger behind Ian Happ. That's a really good spot to be a uh, good, favorable home ballpark, 77 runs, 22 homers, 75 ribbies, nine steals. That feels pretty good. Now I have him at a 270 batting average, even if he just kind of matches this at ADP of 103. I think that's a really good value. But if you add in the possibility that, that run total, if the Cubs do what I think the Cubs are capable of doing, which is not only competing, but maybe winning this division, you're looking at a run total over the 90 mark. If he hits that, if he gets from 22 home runs to maybe squeaks out 25, if he can get that stolen base total into double digits and maybe maintain that 280 batting average, it's going to be a really special player at this return. And I think as an outfielder three slash four, you could do a lot worse than say a Suzuki. And I, again, I think he just gets passed over. You know, he's a guy we kind of take for granted a little bit, and I don't think we should. Uh, Welsh, who's the next guy on your list in terms of draft day bargains? Yeah, and just want to throw out, like, I try to get my shares of Suzuki. I just can never get them. I want them. He's like a chasing Amy. Like, I'm always chasing Suzuki, <laughs> and I can't quite get to That's him. That's one of the lesser Kevin Smith movies, chasing Suzuki. <laughs> yeah, it's you coming don't out. see that one. It used to be on IFC a lot, and then they pulled mm. it. It was very controversial. Sequel coming out in fall. You're going to love it. But uh, I agree. <laughs> Along with a profile. fourth Clerks movie. How many Clerks movies do we have now? And we have two. Ugh, we have two too, too many. many. We were good yeah. with just one. So, the one all right. Uh, but number two, I'm actually going to stick in the outfield, and I'm going to go with Teoscar Hernandez. Teoscar Oscar Hernandez with an ADP average of 108. Not one site has him inside the top 100. And as a matter of fact, even ESPN has got him around 149, so almost 150. Now, why Teoscar Hernandez? Well, you're getting him out of the bad ballpark in Seattle, where he still hit 26 homers last year, 93 RBIs with a 258 batting average. His batting average has sunk the last three years, but we haven't dipped under 250. And we had bad ballpark factors. Really, frankly, if you're looking at like even like Toronto to see Seattle. Now you're going to the Dodgers where it's better, but also the offense. That's the big major focus is what this offense is going to be. You've got a guy 49.4% hard hit rate this past season. He sits between 48 and 52. So big hard hit numbers. He gets the ball in the air. He hits the ball hard. 13.8% barrel percentage. Those are hitting metrics that we love. Those go along with sustainable expected stats. His expected batting average was actually the exact same number as his batting average. And at the end of the day, you give me a power bat like that in a better ballpark, on a better team, that's going to turn the lineup over more. 
he's going to have more opportunity that could move him up the lineup. Now, sure, this lineup is so good, he could be hitting six or seven, but the RBI opportunities are going to be there. If you want to look at some of the projection systems, ATC has 26 homers, 261 with seven stolen bases. The Bat X, 29 homers, 10 stolen Mm. bases, 80 plus on the run in RBIs with a 268 batting average. I think he is crossing 30. Good shot at 35 homers this year. And he's going outside the top 100. Outfield can get kind of bleh pretty quick. Mm -hmm. It can get away from you. But Teoscar Hernandez, even in a three outfielder league, I think is a prime target. In a three outfielder league, if you can already have two guys, he's your third. In a five outfielder league, even more priority because that power bat, the value of the really the four categories with a little sprinkle of stolen bases is immense in one of the best lineups in baseball. Teoscar Hernandez, a definite draft day bargain. His career high, 116 RBI back in 2021. Welsh, I think he could match that. I think he can go over 100 this year in this Dodger lineup. It, it, if everyone stays healthy and this Dodger lineup does what it's yep. supposed to do, and you mentioned about like that outfield cliff that we always talk about. You, if you're in a five-active outfielder league, you have to be looking around this range here. We mentioned Suzuki, we mentioned Hernandez. I've got another one on my list here, Lane Thomas, who you know everyone's just yelling about regression, yelling about regression, even if he regresses. I keep coming back to the same thing, and I know I've mentioned him on other shows before, but I want to drive this home at ADP of 109. The projections right now, 22 homers, 81 runs scored, 73 RBI, 15 steals, 250 batting average. So you're giving me 2015. Okay, last year it was 28-20. That was absurdly good. I keep saying, if we just looked at the numbers and took away Lane Thomas, took away the fact he plays for the Nationals, we'd be talking about this guy as a third-round pick. But instead, we're talking about him at ADP of 109. Why? Because he plays for the Nationals, because people don't believe yet. In 2022, again, he only hit 240, but he still had the 17 homers and eight stolen bases. You saw the jump forward this past season. And I am buying in to Lane Thomas. Again, it doesn't cost you a lot here for that baseline. And the projections of that baseline, I think, are very fair. And you already know that he's good enough to go above them because he just did it last year. So is he a perfect guy? No, He's still hitting towards the top of that order. I know the 325 BABIP, you know, inflated the average to 268 a little bit. I get that. But at the same time, uh, I still think this is a player with power and speed that can really help you in those roto formats. And again, a value in the outfield. Before we get to the next guys on our list, too, I just want to remind everybody, this is that time where most of you have done your drafts already. So if you haven't already, sync your leagues. If you missed out on the draft season opportunity, There's still plenty of time. Sync your leagues for free over at Fantasy Pros and use the tools and use my playbook because my playbook is going to give you that personalized league dashboard for all your leagues. I mentioned I could set all your lineups there Uh, for premium members too. You can do all kinds of amazing things with like analysis, projected stats, waiver wire ad drops, all these incredible things. But basically what the MLB My Playbook gives you is custom news, custom rankings, custom analysis. And it gives you all that ability to control all your teams in one spot, which I got to say, like, that is the biggest time suck ever when you're in multiple leagues. I'm on this platform. I got two leagues on that platform, three leagues on that platform. It's crazy. You know what? This Bogman is the way to told do us, it. Top Bogman has told me, too, our, our dear friend Bogman, that he is now in a space where he will only play if it's on one league. He's like, I only want to play on this platform because he doesn't want to move. Mm-hmm. Well, my playbook fixes that because now you yeah. can go and play on all the platforms and change it in one spot, which that's all that anybody really wants. Go check it out yourself. Uh, fantasypros.com slash MLB my playbook or just download the MLB my playbook app and sync your leagues for free and see what we're talking about because this is going to save you time it's going to give you the right answers to setting your lineup to analyzing trades to making waiver wire pickups you could see all the free agents in every single league that you're in and then just go and add them it's crazy good check it out today Welsh let's check out the next guy on your list uh, for bargains in 2024 Yeah, you know, it's funny that bargains definitely can have a feel kind of boring. And I think this guy might have a boring feel. But the the whole uh, reason behind that, again, is like they're just such good value at where they're going. And a lot of these guys we've talked about, they haven't moved a whole bunch in value. And this is another one of those that has shown up in different episodes. The guy I'm going to give you uh, has an ADP right around 130, and it's Josh Naylor. 
Josh Naylor with the Guardians, who last year put up some absurd uh, RBI numbers in 121 games, 97 RBI. He had double-digit stolen bases, 17 homers. Again, 121 games. He also hit over 300. This spring, he's over 300 again. He's not striking out. He's even stolen a couple more bases. The hitting profile of Naylor is solid. Expected batting average supports his really good batting average. It was a 293 last year, which was in the upper echelon of the league. Again, the the barrel percentage is solid. He gets the ball in the air. He hits the ball hard. He hits in the middle of the order. Projections love him because of the high batting average. And that is something that gets away from us. So, I mean, two things we could pretty easily identify. What gets away from us in drafts from a hitting perspective? The outfield position and batting average. And mm -hmm. Josh Naylor... He devoids that. The power potential might not be like what we've talked about with Teoscar Hernandez, but I think the floor is in the 20s. The ceiling is around 30. He's going to have a prime RBI spot because there's a lot of guys that run in front of him. That team does score a lot of runs. And he even sneakily steals some bases. So here's what I love about Josh Naylor. You screw up on first base. He's great. He's not a big mm -hmm. power bat, but he's great. What he also does is he allows you to go a little bit more power later. Maybe you want to snag a Jorge Soler. And then in corner infield, you want to get a Reese Hoskins. Boom. But guess what also? Let's say you go early first base. Go to Pete Alonso, who I think you should take with elite power. Little question on batting average. Guess what? You can swoop in post 100, get a corner infielder in Josh Naylor who supports really high batting average, good RBI numbers, sneaky stolen bases. There's at least three categories in there. Josh Naylor is a draft day bargain for show. Everyone's sick of me talking about Josh Naylor, so I'm only going to say this. You, you mentioned maybe the powers behind a little bit. He slugged 489 last year in 121 games. I know it only equivalated to 17 homers, but... I know extrapolation is a little dangerous, but if you just push that t number just a little bit, 22 to 25 is not out of the question here. He's hitting clean up in this lineup. As you mentioned, Jimenez, Quan, and Ramirez all ahead of him. There's going to be plenty of RBI opportunities. There were plenty last year. He drove in 90 plus runs already. Uh, I, I'm telling you, like, I am in. I'm all in, especially if you get him as your corner guy. Man, I love Naylor. He gives you the batting yeah. average. He, more pop than you might realize, too. Also, I want to give you credit. Uh, you created a Welsh's in there. You said equivalated. <laughs> yeah, I think you created a new <laughs> I, word. You yeah, equivalated. Need the equivalations, my friends. My <laughs> friends, come here. You come for the baseball, you stay for the equivalations, my friends. We equivalated Josh Naylor to I be... meant to say equivalent. It's I know, no, it was a great season. word. It was a great word, though. I just wanted to highlight. That's something I would do, and it would go in the Welsh it book. Is. That is well, equivalent. <laughs> this is what happens when you spend too much time with the Welsh. Eventually, you start to... Sound like him, and uh, before I know it, I'll be wearing baseball caps on every show. All right, number uh, three on my list here going through. Uh, next one is Andres Munoz, the closer for the Seattle Mariners. Uh, we talked recently, Welsh, about ha having your plan and how you want to approach relief pitcher. If you have mandatory RP slots, it changes the dynamic a little bit. If you don't, I still like playing the waiver wire. I like to wait and let the market come to me a little bit. This is exactly where I like the market to come because I feel like – Munoz has that chance to jump a tier. He's going at 111 overall. Last year, 96 strikes, excuse me, two years ago, 96 strikeouts in 65 innings. Last year, 67 strikeouts in 49 innings, right? So this is a player that you know the strikeout's going to be there. So far, the last two years, both the ERAs under three. So he has dominant type stuff. He has the job. It's a terrific team that's going to give him a ton of save opportunities because this is a tremendous pitching staff. This is not like some half-assed staff. We're talking about like some premium guys. George Kirby could win a Cy Young, according to Welsh, and he might not be wrong here. I actually put some money on it a little bit just in case he is right. Hey. That way I'm making some money on what Welsh says. But you've got Gilbert. You've got Kirby. You've got Luis Castillo at the top of this rotation. you got Bryce Miller and, and Brian Wu at the back end. It feels like every day there's a chance for a quality start and a chance to get the ball into Munoz's hand to get a save. He could save 40 games this year. And I, I know like saves can be tricky in terms of, you know, it's hard to gauge exactly what that's going to be. But usually the the perfect storm for saves is a good offense, not a great offense and a really good pitching staff. And I feel like Seattle kind of encapsulates that, right? They got the one big star guy in Julio. The rest of the offense is, is good. There's still a big bat away from being with the big boys, but that pitching staff is very good. They're going to be in a lot of games where I think they're going to have leads because of the pitching staff, but not blowing teams out on a daily basis because they don't have a juggernaut lineup that has Otani and Betts and Freeman in it. So I'm looking at Munoz and I'm saying, yeah, this is exactly where I want to be taking this guy. 
to me, this is the sweet spot of closers. Evan Phillips is in there. Munoz is in there, right? It's that group of guys that I like to target. So Munoz, to me, he gives you everything you're looking for in terms of the strikeout upside. You know it's going to be there. You know the save opportunities are going to be there, too. He saved just 13 games last year in 49 innings. But again, he didn't have the job the whole time. This year, it could be a big difference in terms of um, what that save total might be. But also... I was so hyped about this guy last year. I'm just doubling down because I know how good he can be. So Welsh, uh, I don't know about you, but this is to me the sweet spot where Phillips, Munoz, I like those two guys, but Munoz especially too, because I think he still will go cheaper than Phillips every single time. Well, Phillips is my guy, but I yeah. like Munoz more be with the Matt Brash injury because Matt Brash, one of the best pitches in baseball in that uh, sweeper slider. But mm -hmm. that injury set him back a little bit. And I think that's just more of a reason to not take Munoz out of it, especially if it's something nursing all year. So I like it. I, but I'm a Phillips guy. But I, I, know. I don't hate I like Phillips Munoz too. Call. But I still say in most drafts, you're going to Phillips because he's a Dodger is going to go ahead. And maybe Munoz, you get 10 picks later. But that's almost like the warning signal that goes up where you go, oh, Boom, there's Phillips. Okay, I better be ready. Well, I like your want logic, Munoz, though, I, I want to point out. I liked your logic of like, the, these are great pitchers that can go six or seven. This is an offense that might not blow any teams out. They could be playing a ton of close games because the pitching staff isn't going to keep them in. The offense is fine, and there might be a lot of save opportunities. So I like that logic. All right, let's get back to you here because you've got a pitcher as well. Actually, two more pitchers to talk about. So let's get to this first one here. Who's on your draft day bargain list in the on the mound. That's well, the we're, we're going to stay with the guardians. And again, the boring is going to kind of show itself here, but that's okay because we're going to just take bargains. This is a guy I've been very critical of, but we've seen a yeah. huge positive sign in spring and that is velo increase. And we're talking about Shane Bieber, who by the way, has an ADP right next to Naylor. It's 126 on average, but again, it floats around. Uh, he goes as low as like 160 in NFBC in the early ones, CBS around 133. And the thing about Bieber is he's going to eat innings. We know that. Last year, he started walking a little bit more. The strikeout numbers, they took this really, really increased, uh, uh, a heavy decrease overall in velocity over the last two seasons, averaging 91.3 both seasons. But He's up to 94 on average in spring again. That's the sweet sauce. That's the thing that we needed. Even in 2022, when the velo decrease started, you still had the slider and the knuckle curve with a 40% whiff rate. All of those, everything dramatically dropped last year. But we're back with increased velo. And I think that is a great sign for Shane Bieber because Bieber is going to eat innings. He is the guy they're going to put out there as much. But 2022... He had 100 and or no, he had 200 innings last year due to injury set him back. He's still 28 years old. Also think if the Guardians get out of it, Bieber's a prime trade candidate and he's a guy that is going to frontline a rotation. I think the the fall of Bieber and his value is why we've got to target him now because we're taking risks earlier in our drafts. We're taking the Tarek Skubles. We're taking the Tyler Glass now. So those guys could lose innings. We love Dodger pitchers, Bobby Miller. How many innings can he get? Mm. We're dealing with a world where pitching innings don't really exist at the same clip that they they did in Nowhere the past. Close. So if you can find, and this is something I've been preaching, if you can find some boring pitchers that can get you 200 innings, they're going to walk themselves into some good stats. Bieber might be boring, but he's on the uptick back with that fastball. He can get 200 innings easy. And I think he is a main target. He's a main target in pretty much any time I can. SP4 every time. SP4, SP5. Doesn't really matter if I have a boring rotation. I have one where I had like Yamamoto and Kirby. I know that there's some sexiness in that, but like, you know, it's kind of got a floor. I'll play floor rotations or scary rotations. Bieber belongs in both. Only five guys through 200 innings last year, just to put that kind of in perspective. If you go back to, let's see, 2013, that's just 10 years ago. Uh, well, you want to guess what that number was of guys? Oh, through gosh. Things? Yeah, it was probably uh, how many years ago? 13? 10 years ago. Say? Yeah. Oh, I'm going to say it's like uh, thir uh, 13 guys. 34. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whoops. And another, let's see, looks like uh, another 15 through 190 or more. So. Just saying, well, things baseball have changed a lot a very in 10 years. It's a very different game for pitching, and that's why he's kind of a throwback player. And I love the idea of a throwback player re-increasing some of their offerings. And that's why, you know, Bieber, in, outside the top 100, is a great value.
even five years ago, 2018, you still had 12 guys go over 200 innings and looking around this over 190, 24 guys. So not bad. Like that, that's still kind of decent. So the change from 10 years ago to five years ago to last year, the, the specialization is tough and finding guys who can go all the way into that 180 range even is, is getting harder and harder to find. All right. The next guy on this list is another one that, uh, I just continue to see as a huge value. Uh, I'm going to try to get as many shares as I possibly can with my remaining drafts, but I don't have any yet. Uh, there's a keeper home league that I'm in that he's already being kept, so I'm already out uh, of that business there. But Zach Geloff, to me, I can keep looking at what this kid accomplished last year. And what's so stunning to me was what he did in the minor leagues, exactly what he did in the major leagues. He hit for a decent average. He gave you power. He gave you speed. Last year, 69 games for him, 14 homers, 14 steals. I don't know what more you need him to prove. He is basically a 2020 guy sitting out there at ADP of 139 at second base. We talked about second base being difficult. We talked about the pivot points of Marte, right? Well, if you miss out on Marte, then what do you do, right? That was my backup plan. Well, I can't get Albies. I can't get Simeon. All right, well, Marte's there. Ooh, no, that hurt. He went off the board. So what do you do? Giloff's right there. And the reason why he's floating at 139, folks, is very simple. He plays in Oakland. That's it. It's the only thing at this point that I can understand of why he's still floating around here. We hype out so many of these other prospects all the time of what they can do, and yet they haven't had nearly the uh, the amount of exposure at the major league level that Geloff had last year. So just under 70 games, again, 14-14, 267. He's still going to hit the top of this order. He is still going to give you power. He's going to give you speed in salary cap drafts. He is a tremendous value, especially in roto format. So I'm just saying, like, this is one of these players that's really floating under the radar. Look for some players on bad teams. Even though they're bad teams, they're still going to score some runs. And I think Oakland is going to be a little bit better than it was last year. There's really nowhere to go but up. But I got to tell you, this is the one player, too, that I keep circling that if he was playing for the Boston Red Sox, if he was playing for the Chicago Cubs, if he was playing for any New York team or Los Angeles team, We'd be talking a lot more about Zach Geloff, but instead he plays for the A's. So nobody's talking about him. And to me, it makes him an enormous bargain because I don't think 2020 is off the table for him at all. And you can also argue in a middle infield spot, he's probably going to hit for a better average and give you 2020 just like Volpe will, but the better batting average will be a Geloff most likely. So Welsh, I don't know how you feel about Geloff and you get to see a lot of these guys out there on the West coast too. Is Geloff somebody that you've been targeting in drafts? Yeah, I actually just got him in a keeper league uh, as it was this dispersally draft type of thing. What I like about him is the 2020 potential. What I don't like yeah. about him is he's in Oakland, Vegas soon. And, you know, some of the batter ball skill stuff, it's a little bit of concern. There are big strikeout worries. But what I will tell you, you said something interesting. Like if he was in a big market team, we'd be talking about him. It's kind of similar to Anthony Volpe. There's a Volpe-ness to him. Volpe has got some swing and miss issues. I think Geloff has bigger strikeout worries than Volpe does, but they both got some of those concerns. Volpe is moving up in a lot of ways. We're not seeing that with Geloff. I think it's a great target. I think it's a um, you know draft a bargain. I will say this. Because he's not on like a Cardinals or something like that, he's not getting the buzz. He would be a mm -hmm. top 100 buzzy type of player, but I won't be shocked when he goes 2020. Look, in 2022, his double. See, I always go to the double A numbers because, especially those West Coast guys, when they, you know, you play in PCL, things get inflated. So I'm not even talking about like the triple A numbers in 2023, which were terrific. The 304, 401, 529 slash. That was terrific. I'm talking about double A, 87 games in double A in 2022. Guess what? 13 homers, nine steals, hit 271, OPS around 800, like right on that precipice there. To me, like, this is exactly like this is who he is. Is he going to strike out a little bit? Yeah, that's probably true. I think he's a better Roto player than a points league player, possibly, especially. But I think the volume hitting in the two hole in this order could possibly make up for any of those strikeout deficits when it comes to Geloff. All right, let's get another guy on your list. You've got another pitcher, another one of my favorite guys I talk about all the time, who is absolutely dominating spring training right now. So let's talk about him, Welsh. Yeah, we're talking about Shoto Monaga, who has just been lights out in spring with the Cubs. 19 strikeouts so far in, what is it, nine and two-thirds pitch. He's only walked a few. We know that the fastball has been an absolutely dominant pitch for Shota. WBC stuff plus numbers are, were absolutely through the roof. He's deceptive in his delivery. He's explosive on the release. Uh, Justin Steele talked up crazy on him. We've seen the results through spring. And his cost, let me look, I forgot to write it down. 
this this is the craziest thing with this type of buzz. I think there's a stigma that kind of goes around sometimes with a lot of like, what is the translation going to look like from pl uh, players that come over from either Japan or Korea? Um, Hassan Kim, one of those examples. Pitching is a little bit different. Shota has an ADP, an average ADP of 190, even going outside the top 200 in sites. Now he is starting to get on a rocket, but guess what? Even that rocket that's moving up the ADP, it's still a bargain. It's not going to take a ton. It's just going to take innings and relative success that we've seen in spring for him to blow past the value. So even if he goes from 190 ADP and goes up to 150, there's still a ton of room for growth. Win opportunities for the Cubs. He's going to have the support. It's not a guy that's going to be pushed off into a bullpen anytime soon. The fastball, the IV, all the, the release points. Like There's some dominant stuff in there that we I think is going to have a really difficult time for translation early on. So Shota is a draft day bargain. He is one of the few buzzy players from spring that has not gone and broken past their value. Mm -hmm. So get him. Go and get yeah. him. Put him in the rotation. SP five or six there's huge upside i mean look i feel good about him as my three i gotta be honest with you so any spot where you can get him as your four or five or yeah i don't know where you're getting him as your six starter but sign me up for that league. well That's 190 I mean. if, if you're going around 190 or let, I let guess. me take a look <laughs> I'm looking on I Fantasy guess. Pros right now. I can see ADPs. Yahoo, he's got a 186 ADP, 186 players through. You easily could have four to five pitchers already locked in, and then you're putting him at the bottom. That's what it's makes tremendous. him even more of the draft day bargain. All right, back to my list here. 167, Francisco Alvarez of the New York Mets. Now, you know I love a player if I love him despite the fact that he plays for my Mets because Alvarez is a guy that has 30 home run potential this year at catcher. I understand the batting average is a bit of a drag. I get that. But let's not forget, this guy was one of the top five prospects in all of baseball coming into last year. Let's not forget, the batting average was much higher over the minor league career. Now, he did struggle a little bit at AAA, but still, 273 batting average, 384 on base, a 529 slugging over 257 minor league games. Last year was about getting comfortable at the major league level. He showed you the power. You're learning a pitching staff. You're trying to figure out things. It's a process. Again, he's only going to be 22 years old this year, and he's hitting cleanup for the Mets. So he is hitting in front of McNeil, but behind Pete Alonso with Nimmo, Lindor, and Alonso all ahead of him. What a great situation it is. You have to pitch to Francisco Alvarez in this lineup, and I think you're going to have to quite a bit because I think those guys are going to be on ahead of him, and I think that that could mean a huge breakout potential for Alvarez. And we like some of these other catchers. We like Ohape. We like um, we like Moreno. We like Garver. There's some values there. But if I'm going to circle the guy that can hit 30 homers and really be special and also DH because they want to get his bat in the lineup when he's not catching, it's Francisco Alvarez. And I think there's upside for a lot more, but also a pretty good value already built in at 167. Welsh, one more guy on each of our lists. So let's get after it here. Your favorite draft day bargain remaining on the board of 2024. And he is the cheapest of all the guys that we've talked about yep. so far. Yeah, I did. I ordered mine in kind of a uh, most expensive to cheap outside the top 200. This As has been a guy eye. that we've talked a bunch, a bunch about. Jamer Candelario. So I did say like Josh Naylor would be such a cool corner infielder. It's not going to happen all the time. Naylor, especially at 15 team Roto, he's going to be a top uh, 15 first baseman. So it doesn't always happen. So you're going to have to look elsewhere. When I do, it's Jamer Candelario, who last year hit 251, 22 homers, 70 RBI, 70 runs, but now goes to Great America Ballpark. Going to play every single day in that explosive young lineup with Ellie De La Cruz, Matt McClain in front, and players falling left and right. So if there's any other question about, you know, how is his playing time going to be consistent? It's locked in there. This is one of those instances where you see projections after having a fine season, 29, 30 year old. Now you see projections beat across the board on almost every system. You see the numbers going higher. 22 homers last year. You look over on uh, the bat X, it's right at 21, but the batting average 252 higher than last year. You see projections around 260. You see RBI numbers, even in zips up to 88. This is a great place to hit with guys that are running in front of him. I think the RBI opportunities can get into the 90s. I think he can hit around 260. And I think the home run totals are being undersold. He 
has some of that Josh Naylor in him that he can hit for higher batting average. And I wouldn't be shocked if he put up a Josh Naylor 97 RBIs this year. Mm. I love Candelario and he qualifies at first and third. He is an ultimate draft day bargain. Got to have him on your team. Util, corner infield, whatever it is. I want Jamer Candelario. He's one of my favorite players to draft in its post 200. I have one question when it comes to Candelario, which I think is the most important one. And again, I don't think you have a crystal ball, but I'm going to ask it anyway. When Marte comes back from the suspension, is there any chance that he's the one that gets squeezed if everybody's healthy? Uh, I would say 1% chance because what originally was planned was Candelario was going to be the everyday first baseman. That was going to be his gig. Mm -hmm. Strand was going to play DH a little bit of first and maybe move around in the outfield. So I think they go back to that, but we're going to have a better insight. We've also seen Fraley get hurt. TJ Friedel get hurt. We're now going to have to see Benson to see if he can do anything more than a split where Spencer Steer sits. There's a lot of questions. There are a lot of guys out there, but they signed Candelario to be the core, the middle, a team leader that these guys build around. So no, I don't think Candelario is affected in any way when Noel V. Marte comes back. All right, last guy for me is another veteran, 37-year-old at ADP of 176, You Darvish. Uh, Darvish, the concern was the health. Well, the elbow uh, bone issue that he was able to take care of, everything got cleaned up there. No, It was the bone spurs, I believe, correct? Well, sure, right? correct me if I'm wrong. That sounds, that's what sounds right. That sounds right. I'm just making things sure. up. No, it was the bone yeah. spurs issues and something that Cole Hamels had years ago too, and he got it cleaned up and he was fine the next year. So far in spring, as of recording this, nine innings over three starts for him, 10 strikeouts, one walk, a 1.07 whip, a 2.89 ERA over those nine innings. Now it's only nine innings, but it's important nine innings because it's telling me you Darvish is healthy. Now, if you Darvish is healthy, this is a guy that has 200 strikeout potential and you're getting him where? 176? That's absurd. We talked about the Imanaga value at 190. Look, if these two guys are on the board, I'm still going to take you Darvish every single time because it's a proven track record. I know last year was ugly, but he still had a three to one strikeout to walk ratio over those 136 innings. It was really a matter of getting that elbow right and, and getting healthy. He was not healthy all of last year. We've seen Darvish at times have down seasons and rebound. This seems like it's setting up for another one, but it's scarier every time, and I get why. It's because of the age. When you're 37 years old, you see some of these guys, you know, getting to their late 30s, early 40s. You see Scherzer, Verlander, Kershaw, all those guys starting to break down, and that might be the case. Maybe he's not a guy who's going to throw 190 innings ever again. We're going to give you 160. If he does, he's going to give you phenomenal productivity, and the upside's there for more. The Padres are still a really good team. I know Soto's not there, but they still got Bogarts. They still got Tatis. They've still got Machado. They still got Kim. It's a really good rotation, too. We started the show talking about how loaded the National League West is. We talked about the Giants edition of Snell. We talked about the juggernaut lineup that is the Dodgers. And here are the Padres, not to mention the Arizona Diamondbacks that went to the World Series, but the Padres here with a rotation that arguably is the best one when healthy because you're talking about Darvish, King, Musgrove, Cease, Man, Welsh, the Padres, I don't think are going away. And if you Darvish is right, I think this is one of the best draft day bargains you're going to find. What do you think about you Darvish? And are you somebody like me that's looking for him everywhere and taking the discount everywhere? I would say I actually wrote his name down on this, started to go. And the only reason I didn't was because the airing of this episode was going to be after his uh, start, his first start, and it could either be really bad or really good. But at the end of the day, yes, I want you, Darvish. You, Darvish, he's one of those guys that it could go either way. Like the injuries can keep him off. He, he was pretty inconsistent last year, but we know what the stuff is. We know when he hones in, he can go deep innings. He can be a massive strikeout guy. He can easily blow past his ADP and his value and be dare I say, like we did the episode league winning, like he could be that type of player with where you're getting him, getting a guy, you know, that is maybe the 40th SP or 35th SP off the board. That could be a top 10. They're hard to find at this level. And he is one of those guys. But the problem is the variance though. I am taking him wherever I can. Absolutely. Well, fun fact last year, you want to take a guess where he was on fantasy pros, uh, average draft position in terms of pitcher rank where it would be SP what going um, into last year. I mean, I, I want to say it wasn't super high. If I remember correctly, was it like 28, 19? Okay. Okay. No, it was super 19. High. So again, a healthy you Darvish now is being regarded as, let's see you Darvish right now is 
51, the 51st yeah. starting pitcher. That's absurd. Something in the middle is very likely, but there's also that range of outcomes where he gets back to somewhere on the top 25. And yeah. if that happens, that is a huge bargain discount. But we want to hear from you. Drop your comments below. You tell Welsh and myself who your favorite draft day bargains are of 2024. Let's all help each other out here. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. But when you do, not only drop your comments, but also make sure you ring that bell for notifications. So you know, every time a piece of content drops here on the town on the channel, we've got the podcast, the short form videos, we've got the social shorts on here, the YouTube shorts, but we've also got leading off live starting Thursday, the 28th, where Welsh and I are going to wig out because you guys are amazing. And now we have 17,000 subscribers on the channel. We want to get it to 20. God knows it kind of stupid. We'll do a 20. But at 17, we're going to be wearing our wigs. I'm going to order mine right after recording this today. Hopefully, Welsh is landing on his because, you know, a two-day Amazon Prime. You got to get the wigs here ready to go. So join us live, 1230 Eastern Time, every Monday through Thursday. Again, starting on the 28th. That's Thursday, opening day. It's going to be a glorious time. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to talk a lot of baseball, and we're going to win a lot. That's what we're going to do, win a lot of leagues. All right, that'll do it for us. But the story of the game goes on for the Welsh. I'm Joey P., We'll see you next time, kids. Enjoy your peace. bargain hunting. Peace, peace, peace. <laughs>